So I'm going to talk a little bit about work that we've been doing. This is 30 years now, so it's sort of interesting that the three decades uh, um, later have now reached this point. Unfortunately, over the years, I've been able to work with a uh, great team of people um, in using this technology. And the, one of the things I just want to point out, and neurosurgeons are techies. We all know that. We've heard it today. Um, but in my view, it's our role as surgeons, especially if we're not the ones, for example, inventing a technology, um, it's our role not to just use it and say, yeah, it's sort of cool. Um, it's our role as surgeons to prove that it has value and to put it into perspective of where that value lies in terms of, uh, of patient uh, care. And we've been uh, working uh, with this particular technology now for, uh, for 30 years. So in line with current world, um, I'll tell you about my conflicts. So you saw this picture earlier. Um, they, he had truncated it a little bit, so not everybody was actually in the picture. Uh, for example, you can see a youthful Peter Janetta on the far right, um, uh, sort of looking heads up. Uh, and in the far left, in the very back, whom you basically can hardly see, and that's because he was a rather diminutive man himself, is uh, Stuart Rao, that's the man with the uh, glasses uh, um, back there. And uh, the uh, um, group of people here, as we said, it was sort of a hairy time. Um, the white-haired man on the uh, um, sort of third row back there uh, on the right was a guy named Yale Koskoff, who was one of the last um, original neurosurgical psychiatrists and had uh, come through the world of uh, lobotomy and all of this other kind of, uh, of uh, stuff, uh, but was still on the, uh, on, on the, uh, on, on the faculty. So uh, this was a, uh, um, a, a great uh, group of, uh, of uh, people, and each one of these individuals I could tell a small vignette about over the course of time. And since I've been in the same place for such a long time, uh, again, we're, we're going to put together this sort of 50-year perspective of, uh, of, the, uh, of the department. Um, so uh, Peter Janetta um, gave me this idea that uh, I, I could uh, do something that none of you can do, that is the residence. And that is that in the current world, it's very hard to disappear for a few months. Uh, and uh, what I did was, as a, uh, uh, a senior resident in my fifth year, um, I went to Europe for three months, and I made this decision that uh, oh, if I had a chance, I wanted to spend longer there. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, I applied for the Van Wagenen Fellowship and uh, uh, actually got that. And at that time, um, uh, I didn't really have a, uh, a job uh, uh, clear. This was uh, in April of uh, my final year as chief resident. And I went finally back to Dr. Jeanette and said, uh, Dr. Jeanette, I have good news. Uh, and he said, what's that? And I said, well, I just got this Van Wagenen. He went, oh, that's great. He said, you, we'll have to hire you after all, I guess. Um, and uh, so he said, and I said, you know, the problem is I've got to spend a year in Sweden and the, and the pay is $10,000 for a year. And oh, don't worry about that. We'll help you out. We'll make this, we'll make it work. And, and, uh, and uh, he, he, uh, he did. So I got a lot of uh, good ideas from people uh, there uh, at that era of uh, neurosurgery. There was no uh, image guided surgery being done in the United uh, States and certainly not in our own program, really. Um, and uh, we had this concept of putting this uh, stereotactic operating room uh, suite, putting the first uh, CT scanner in the operating room in 1982 as a dedicated unit. At that point, there were only two CT scanners in the city of Pittsburgh. MRI didn't exist, and we had to sell this to uh, the health systems agency, a regulatory group at the time, saying it was a therapeutic device. It was not a diagnostic device. And it's pleased that this is being used so extensively over those uh, years now, of course, in a lot of uh, spine surgery. But I also had this idea that maybe we could uh, uh, bring in this other technology um, called the Gamma Knife, and it began about a four or five year process of getting it through uh, hospital approvals and then regulatory approvals to get it uh, started. 
And some years ago, one of the residents made this particular slide um, that uh, what we were doing was a more civilized form of brain surgery. You saw lots of red pictures uh, today, but I never show you any red, any, red, uh, any red pictures. The concept of this is that uh, we could take a tumor, as you see here, a brain metastasis, and uh, destroy it by cross-firing X-ray beams on it. Over the course of these 30 years, then there's been considerable growth, not only in the gamma knife, but obviously new technologies as they came available. Uh, the development of spine radiosurgery, uh, which uh, Peter Gersten and our group uh, uh, pioneered, and then development of uh, other devices, cyber knife, and, and a variety of linear accelerator-based techniques for body and spine uh, radiosurgery. So what's happened over the course of the uh, 30 years has been an enormous growth in the use of this particular technology now over a million patients uh, who have been treated uh, uh, with a very small number beginning in 1987 in our own um, um, center uh, now with uh, some 14,500 patients who have had uh, a gamma knife. We can see that this yellow line represents the largest growth, which we'll talk briefly about, which is the treatment of cancer when it's spread to the brain, brain metastasis, but also uh, we'll go through some of the other indications. Um, these are largely grouped within uh, um, vascular indications, uh, neoplastic or tumor indications, and in certain functional indications where the largest uh, group was related uh, to uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So you've already heard that in the long term, microvascular decompression is unquestionably in the right patients the most effective treatment. Bruce Pollock, among others, has uh, amply demonstrated that in the Mayo experience. But the problem is, is not everybody with that disorder is eligible for microvascular decompression. They may be elderly, everybody's on Plavix or aspirin or something else like that now, and so you needed other alternatives, and that's where percutaneous techniques first, such as glycerol rhizotomy, and then ultimately trigeminal neuralgia management with radiosurgery. So we look at vestibular schwannomas. Um, we've treated now over 1,800 uh, patients. It's a primary management in 84% of patients. 16% represent those uh, who've had tumor uh, growth or progression after surgery. It's done as an outpatient, gets patients back to work in 24 hours, maintains quality of life, and clearly reduces uh, costs. Um, so if we look at this, we see that these tumors frequently shrink over the course of time, and actually the ones that are partially cystic to begin with are the most likely to shrink over the course of time with volumetric regression uh, in, uh, in uh, the vast majority of patients. And it can be used in older patients who you might have concerns about. And what this has done from a training standpoint, as we showed some years ago, um, and part of this, of course, is selection bias based on training, ref uh, referral of patients for specific things, is that the number of patients who are undergoing surgical resection for acoustic neuromas has dropped as the usage of radiosurgery has increased. So. Um, What's uh, this done at 30 years? Uh, we now know that it's at less than 1% risk of facial weakness. We can save hearing depending on the preoperative level in 50 to 90% of the world. Um, and there's a 4% late failure rate requiring something else, either repeat radiosurgery or open surgery. So who needs a resection at the present time? Patients with symptomatic mass effect from larger volume tumors. And what type of resection should they have? They should have one that preserves existing cranial nerve function, and that can be followed by adjuvant radiosurgery. <clears throat> so if we extrapolate microsurgical data, this is sort of not fair in some ways, but if we take current data, if we look at, uh, for example, SAMI's outcome data for acoustic neuroma, what this is meant to now 100,000 patients worldwide who have had uh, surgical, uh, um, have had radiosurgery management, it's reduced deaths by 1,400 patients, eliminated 2,400 clots or strokes, prevented 10,000 CSF leaks, prevented facial palsies in almost 17,000 patients, and saved hearing in about 36,000 uh, patients compared to microsurgical alternatives for management of this problem. Now, we can do elegant surgery, and certainly people in this room have been pioneers in this, uh, but the reality is these tumors are not curable by microsurgical intervention. We can debulk them in certain cases, but by definition, no type of major surgical resection can be occur without destroying cranial nerve function. And in many patients, this tumor can be effectively managed, uh, and I believe in uh, many patients it can be the, the best option. 
If we look at long-term results and preservation of cranial nerve function, they're actually better in the patients who not had initial surgery, who had primary surgical resection and, and preserving cranial nerve uh, function. Another game changer in this has been uh, the treatment of vascular malformations. Of course, there are many patients where intervention for surgical uh, by embolization or microsurgical removal is absolutely appropriate. But there are other patients where uh, the AVM may exist in real estate that's important, and the treatment of this by radiosurgery leading to obliteration and increasing number of patients uh, by the time three to five years passed in 80 to 90 percent of properly selected patients. So one of our goals, and you can't read this, but the goal of this is that we've sat down with fellows, residents, uh, people said, okay, now we've got this database of patients. Your job is to go back and look and say, did we do something that was proper or correct? And that's what we've gotten many people to do. So trigeminal neuralgia was not a, an, not a competitor to microvascular decompression, which we knew was a great uh, procedure. In fact, it was used in recurrent patients or in patients who are not otherwise eligible for microsurgical uh, decompression. And in this case, we uh, treat the uh, trigeminal nerve uh, at the root entry zone designed to try to in, uh, stop the crosstalk of, of these patients. A recent article that we published in Neurology suggested that actually we shouldn't wait too long. Like in epilepsy, where there's seizures for 20 years, there may be kindling, it may be impossible to cure the surgical uh, focus. Uh, whereas if we treat these patients in less than three years, the outcomes are in fact much better in terms of long-term response of their pain control, which can be achieved at least initially in the vast majority of patients, either with a complete state or certainly significant improvement um, and, and now managed with uh, a medical uh, management. What about paracellar tumors? We're not trying to replace the need for surgery. This, in fact, we're trying to use it as an adjuvant uh, for this. It basically has eliminated the need for radiation therapy, which in earlier years was the most common uh, management for patients with incompletely resected uh, uh, tumors. Um, and in the long run, we can save uh, the uh, function in uh, pa patients uh, with about 70% probability, with only 20 to 30% of the patients having a new endocrine axis loss, with up to 89% uh, tumor control. Either my battery's dead or it's dead. So tumor control, as we said, over the course of time has been high um, in patients uh, um, followed over the long run, uh, down to uh, 10 years at 75% progression-free survival. The biggest one, of course, has been related to brain metastasis. This has opened doors for neurosurgeons because in the past, the vast majority of these patients, uh, we were not involved in their care at all. The patients were diagnosed, after which they just went to have whole head radiation therapy. But we shouldn't do that anymore in the vast majority of these, uh, of these patients. Because we don't need to resect them, we can in fact treat them with radiosurgery and they respond beautifully. And uh, uh, we've shown over the course of time that the multiple trials have been done. For, it doesn't matter so much how many there are. It's the total volume of the brain disease that's important, not the number. We can treat 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 um, as uh, needed. As we see, what's the impact has been that in terms of a comparison to AVMs, which is what we started out with 30 years ago, that the greatest growth over the course of time is related to the very common disease that we deal with brain metastasis. So we finally made it in New England Journal, not in a published article, because that's not what this has done. But what it shows you is that in this sort of funny uh, diagram and 200 years of cancer uh, research, somehow gamma knife got put at the top. So I think that was very good, even though it had no, no particular reason for that uh, placement. What about in glioma? Well, you know, we know that these have to be resected. Um, and we also know that if we do just resection, that these patients progress very quickly. Uh, they need to have radiation therapy. They need to have adjuvant management for this. Um, but it turns out that radiation surgery also has a role in the management of this problem. At the time of progression, we can't do any more of the usual radiation therapy. But for these tumors, we can treat the residual or growing tumor volume. And if we do that, what we'll see is I'll just look at the uh, far right, the overall survival of patients. We now can get to patients at three years with the worst class uh, for 25% um, uh, three-year survival uh, when these patients are eligible for radiosurgery <clears throat> with a median survival of about 21 months. 
significantly better than uh, the natural history of this with surgery, radiation, and, and standard chemotherapy alone. Now, the issue in the United States especially has been that this is a uh, merger of multiple fields. It's very typical of what uh, we're doing in skull-based surgery, as you've heard earlier. Uh, and um, you know, people used to think that it was the neurosurgeon that was going to be cracking the whip, but I can tell you that the radiation oncologists have become very much involved in this particular, uh, this particular uh, uh, field. It's a paradigm of what care is about in the uh, 21st uh, century with multiple uh, people being involved uh, in, the, in the care of these patients, uh, and gamma knife and radiosurgery as a field is very much involved with that. Part of our role was to pr um, uh, open the... Uh, uh, windows relative to uh, um, how this could be used and what the long-term outcomes were. And so we've encouraged our team members uh, to publish uh, um, uh, on a regular basis relative to uh, long-term outcomes. And this led us uh, some years ago to create a international foundation now with 26 uh, centers involved in this whose goal is to try to improve outcome data by pooling uh, um, data from individual centers uh, where a rare uh, indication might not have much data but uh, becomes considerably strengthened uh, when uh, added uh, among a multi-center trial. Some of this was certainly possible because at the very beginning, 30 years ago, it was very clear to me that there was very little data to uh, show the value of what this potentially could be. And in order to be able to do that, we needed to have the records and uh, charts and everything else of our patients as well as all of the imaging sequestered in a way that we could access it readily in order to be able to, to do this. So we created a, a database, uh, which many people um, uh, have tapped over the course of years to be able to do outcomes uh, research. And recently migrated that to a new platform, um, and this uh, registry should be something that may be eventually linked uh, to the uh, uh, AANS Astro uh, registry uh, um, and uh, uh, allow us to pull uh, data. So if we look at <clears throat> where this is in terms of indications, uh, clearly uh, brain metastasis is number one. Um, and as technologies proliferate, and now there's not a few gamma knives, there are th uh, 300 across the world and many other competing technologies uh, based on linear accelerators. Um, individual centers uh, will have perhaps a little bit harder time in the same kinds of volume. We treat now about 650 to 700 cases a year. And this has an interesting impact because even though all of us want to get in the operating room, it's our, our, our uh, love there, and this is a slightly different form of uh, surgical intervention. But the reality is, based on the indications, especially brain metastasis, that the number of billing codes that are being submitted for radiosurgery in the United States right now are significantly higher than the number of billing codes being submitted uh, for uh, um, uh, intracranial uh, surgery by, uh, by craniotomy. So uh, in retrospect, or what going on at the present time, I think that overall for radiosurgery, there's been an increasing acceptance among colleagues in the government, um, and even some health insurance, and also our national professional organizations. There has been a changing demographics of the patient base uh, depending on the center and the, and, and the site. There are more than 2,000 publications at the present time with big data pushes that are going on. There's always new stuff, but protons is not one of them. Protons have been around now for over 70 years, still trying to establish a, a, a role. And uh, beware, as you said about, the, as Mark mentioned earlier, about when you're reading all the press and things like that, look for the science be um, behind it. There still seems to be confusion about the difference between neurosurgical radiosurgery and radiation therapy done with a guidance type of a technique. There is, in fact, better science, but still limited uh, funding. Um, and uh, some uh, people, uh, certain insurance companies, including our own, still seem somewhat baffled by, uh, by uh, all, of, uh, all of this. Um, technology is all of our friend. This was an aphorism from uh, Lexell, with whom I trained uh, as a fellow at the uh, Karolinska Institute, uh, but always valuable uh, to uh, um, remember. And a quote that I've shared with others in the past related to what Peter Ginetta and many others in this room have done over the course of time is the general scientific uh, uh, development. Uh, Montaigne uh, 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 described uh, in the 16th century, Whenever there's something uh, new, the, the world will say it's not true. And then finally, when it's found to be uh, truth and they can't question it anymore, they say it may be true, but it's not important. 
And then finally, as time gets past and the importance becomes clear, well, well maybe it's important, but it's no longer new. Let's move on to something new. And uh, I'm sure that there will be new technology developments can, uh, always in our field. That's what we do in our gene pool. And that's what we do as neurosurgeons. But what I want to stress is I think it's very important that we show that what we're doing has value to the patient. Um, and it should be, as Dr. Joe just pointed out, it should be something that is cost effective uh, for the future as well. Thank you.